Dear Heavenly Father, you know, Lord, that you have put in my heart that the, the goal of these sermons is that the kids will know you better through Jesus Christ and love you more. And Lord, I, I know for myself that the good news is never appreciated unless the bad news is understood. And I ask you, Lord, that you'd help me to do so, to convey to the kids their deep, dire need of Jesus, as you would, Lord. Mercy and grace. So we just commit this to you, dear Father, in your kindness, and it will count for eternity. In Jesus' name. And if you can lower that, Joel, uh, some thank you so much, bud. Thank you, Fred. Can't do it without you, bud. Um, why do we gather in this room year after year, service after service, and we come and we study a book that's thousands of years old? Why? Why this book? Why don't we bring our laptops and be current with the culture? You know why, young people? This book is more up to date than tomorrow's newspaper. The reason we come to the scriptures is because the scriptures say that they are able to make you wise unto salvation. If you immerse yourself in these and understand them and know them, they can give you what you need to know in order to believe so that you can spend eternity in heaven with the Lord. They're able to make you wise unto salvation. Well, why, why should I trust these, Michael? There are many books out there. The very next verse says in 2 Timothy 3.16, that all scripture is inspired of God. It's God breathed. The only book of all books that God wrote by his Holy Spirit through about 40 men over 1600 years. That's why we can trust it as the only guide to live forever and to become part of God's family. All right? That's why we come and the scriptures are center to this camp. The day the scriptures go out, the camp is over. Oh, it may go on. But the pleasure of God lifts and goes walk the camp when the scriptures do. And that happens all the time, young people, with individuals, with churches, with denominations, and with nations. When they get rid of the word of God, God goes with it. That's why this must stay central to this camp. Amen? Without this, it's over. But it's amazing how many institutions and churches and people can keep things going religiously, but they've taken this out. And all they are is a hollow shell and a monument to nothing. So that's why we come and we study the scriptures. All right? Now, we're gonna, why are we talking about a queen who lived 3,000 years ago? I want to check out Google tonight. We're not going to Google. We're going to the Queen of Sheba who probably most of you have never heard of. I've never done a study on her until last year, and I was blown away. But she was a woman who lived 3,000 years ago. Well, Michael, what's your interest? Here's my interest. Do you know why? Because Jesus talked about her. And Jesus commended her. And anyone in the scriptures who Jesus talks positively about, I want to know, what is it about her that Jesus admired and commended? Because everyone in this room, if you know him, you want to hear from him on that great day when you stand before him. Well, good. Well done, thou good and faithful servant. Amen? Amen? And so here he talks about the Queen of Sheba. So, okay, I want to hear what he says. You know, you know what he said? He said that the Queen of Sheba will rise at the judgment. Everyone's coming out of their graves at the judgment. Everyone who's in their graves now and think they got away from God and lived without him. Oh, no, they didn't. The Bible says in John chapter 5, that Jesus Christ is going to speak the word and all of those who died and are in the graves are going to come out. No one gets away. No one escapes this great day when all the souls who've ever lived are going to stand before the throne of Jesus Christ and explain everything they did while they were on earth. Most of which we've forgotten. But God knows everything. So watch. Jesus said the Queen of Sheba, she's going to rise out of her grave with the men who lived on the earth during Jesus' time who were with him and saw him and touched him and heard him audibly like all of us wish we could. And you know what he said she'll do? She will condemn the men who had Jesus right there. You know why? Because he, he said she came from the ends of the earth. What did she come for? Here's what she came for. It says in 1 Kings chapter 10 that the queen of Sheba heard about the fame of Solomon 
according to the name of the Lord. You know, can you see that okay? My magic marker's faded, but can you see that okay? It says that the Queen of Sheba, when she heard about the fame of Solomon concerning the name of the Lord, do you know what that means? It means God was so moving in and on Solomon that it's impossible, my, my dear young people, not for your name to rise when God's using you. It doesn't mean you want to, but it happens. All right? And Solomon was being used by God because God made him wiser than any man on the face of the earth at this time. Now watch this. It says that the Queen of Sheba, she heard about the wisdom of Solomon. Now watch. She went because she wanted to hear the wisdom of Solomon. And she was most likely one of the wealthiest people on the surface of the earth at that time. One historian said that of the two countries on the earth at that time, that Sheba was one of the most wealthy. And here she was the queen of it. She was loaded. But you see, beloved, her treasures meant nothing to her. You know why? Because she had everything. But God was working on her. You know what? She was miserable. You can be sure of that. You know, how, how can you tell, Michael? Because Jesus said she came from the ends of the earth. You know how far she came to hear just a man speak words? Twelve to 1,500 miles. On a camel. In the desert. To hear words from a man. She had precious stones and wealth. She had spices, wealth and spices that were worth more than gold, if I remember my study right. In fact, I did a calculator study. She brought to Solomon alone $13 million worth of gold in today's standards. And the, precious, the, the spices were more valuable. And you know why, my young people? She did because she just wanted to hear words from Solomon. Only God can do that. Do you know what? Wasn't Solomon she was really wanting to hear from? It says that she got there... And it says she came with a very heavy force. What does that mean? You know what it, mean? it most likely means? She had a lot of armed guards with her because she was carrying so much loot that you can be sure the desert was riddled with bandits. But watch. She risked her life. She risked her reputation. Can you imagine all the other kings of the earth? Did you hear about the Queen of Sheba? She left her country on that dangerous journey and very uncomfortable to go hear some words from the king of Israel. Can you imagine what a nut they must have thought she was? But you see... God was giving her a tremendous gift where she had all this wealth and rank and power and fame. But watch! It wasn't enough. That's why Jesus said, Woe well unto you is what he meant. If you gain the whole world, but you lose your own soul. So here she comes. All that wealth and rank and power wasn't enough. And she spent, it probably took 75 days, one way, just to get to Solomon. Now you see? Why? She wanted to hear the wisdom of Solomon. Well, we know whose wisdom it was, don't we? Was it Solomon's? No, we already know before that that Solomon asked for wisdom and God said, I'm going to give it to you. I'm going to make you wiser than any man. So watch. If God removes, beloved, his giftings and his grace from your life and the talents that he's given you, you are nothing. You're nothing. If he pulls himself away from you, you're done. So you know what? Solomon was only inflated and famous because God was in it. Now watch. It says the Queen of Sheba, this is so incredible. She finally got there, and it says that she, asked, she tested Solomon with difficult questions. You can be sure she was pouring her heart out. I want to know what life is all about. Because I have wealth, I have popularity, I have fame, I have power, I have rank, and I'm miserable. Tell me what it's about. And I really, with all my heart, that's what the scripture means when it says she tested him with difficult questions. And it says there wasn't anything that she asked Solomon that he didn't tell her. It says in the Bible that nothing was hidden from him. And he answered all her questions. And you know what she said? The report I heard about you wasn't, ha wasn't half. What I've seen isn't half about it. It's, it's, you are so much more than what I expected. Now watch. Can you see that? This is the Queen of Sheba. Now watch. It says, when she saw the wisdom of Solomon, when she saw the palace that he had built, 
When she saw his servants and how they were dressed. When she saw the table that he had before him and the food that he ate. When she saw his cupbearer. Now watch. And then it says, when she saw the way he ascended the steps of the house of the Lord. This is what grabbed me last year that made me study this and develop time machine drama, field drama, sermons. It was this phrase. It says, when she saw all those things about Solomon, it says she was breathless. There was no more spirit in her. Solomon took it away. It says that there was no more spirit in her. And the Chronicles version of the same story says she was breathless. Now watch. This is what brings me to my knees. This is my God jar that I never use enough, but I should use every single day. This is filled probably with billions of grains of sand. Okay? Billions! Now watch. And this is what I... So of all that God is in His infinite majesty and His attributes and His qualities and He's so infinite and vast that we don't even, we aren't even points of a pin in the vast universe and He created the universe. So watch. It says that Solomon took the Queen of Sheba's breath away. And we just said it wasn't Solomon, was it? It was what God put in Solomon. But watch. You know how much of God was in Solomon and it's all it took to take her breath away? One grain. I really wanted to get a razor blade and a little hammer like, like gemologists do when they cut diamonds. Really, let's give God more credit. A half of a grain of all that he is and that's all it took to take the queen's breath away. Seeing one grain of God in Solomon. You see, beloved? That's what, you know, how do you know that, Michael? Watch now. Jesus said, the Queen of Sheba, she came from the ends of the earth to hear the wisdom of Solomon. Watch now. And he said, but now, something greater than Solomon's here. What he meant was, now someone greater than Solomon is here. So, beloved, what do you, this is what grips me and melts me and gives me the camp experience at home in my bedroom where I study. If one grain took her breath away, what in the world is Jesus like? Amen? Wow. This is how I get the camp feelings when I'm not at camp anymore, is by immersing into the Word and meditating on these things. Now watch. I want to show you. What's our theme this week? I want to show you. This is a jar of honey that Mrs. Williamson got for me. I asked her a couple weeks ago. I needed it. You know, you know the treasure about Jesus that is the most important to me right now? It's like honey to my soul whenever I just think of the Word. Now, you remember the hidden treasures of what our theme is of all that who Jesus is and what He's done. And if you want to see my heart just turn to sweet as honey as I think about this truth from the Scripture... And it's a word I'll bet you most of you have never even heard. And it's called propitiation. And I was telling them my Bible study methods class today, and they were doing pretty well at pronouncing it. Propitiation. Most people never even heard the word, and yet it's one of the most precious words to me now in the English language. And I want to teach you, because you know what? Without Jesus being your propitiation, anything else he is to you doesn't matter. And so that very word is just like honey to my soul. Now watch. Before you can understand how precious Jesus' propitiation is to you, you must understand how deeply you need it. When Adam ate the fruit, it plunged the whole human race into death, into darkness, into the kingdom of Satan, into spiritual blindness, into rebellion and hostility against God. By one bite of one piece of fruit, one man, one time. You've heard me say that. And now the clear, pristine nature of man that God had created with him with, innocent, now every part of it is polluted and affected by the sin of Adam. And the it's, Romans 5 says that it's transferred to the whole human race. 
Now watch. You hear it? You see, I use the water pump to make the sin fester. Because that's exactly what sin nature is to God. It's, and this is not really worthy of an object lesson of the sin nature, what it is to God. It reeks with self-centeredness. It reeks with lust. It reeks with wickedness, with malice, with all the sins that you can think of that come from our heart, our mind, our words, our hands. All stands for human nature down in here. And to God, it's a, it's, it's a stench in His nostrils. And that's what the Bible says that man is. At the flood of Noah, it says that all of the thoughts and imaginations of man's heart were only evil all of the time from his childhood. That's the nature of man. That's why Jesus said, you must be born again and start over by His Spirit, or you can never have this enter the kingdom of God. Paul said, or Jesus said, that which is born of flesh, in other words, from one human to another, this is all you get from your parents. This is all I gave to my children. All right? That's why Jesus said, you must be born again if you want to see the kingdom of heaven. Paul said that he knew in his, in his fallen human nature, there didn't live one good... Well, I'm basically a nice person. I have some faults, but I'm basically a good person. Most people out there will say the same thing. But the Bible does not say that. The Bible says that fallen human nature, there isn't one good thing about it. It hates everything that God loves. It's against everything God is for, Galatians chapter 5. It's hostile to God, Galatians 1.21. It cannot subject itself to the law of God. And so the Bible says in Romans 8, chapter 8, chapter 8, verse 8, it says that those who are in the flesh, and what that means is those who are not Christians, they cannot please God. They don't have the ability to. Now watch. And this is what all of you were from conception. David said, in iniquity my mother conceived me. I was born in sin. And it all goes back to the sin of Adam. Now, I'm going to encourage you. Remember, you, I guarantee if you hear and believe and listen to what I say, because I'm going to try it by the God's grace, it'll only be the Scripture, I guarantee you will love God more deeply than you ever have, maybe. Not because of anything to do with dirty, but because of the Scripture that this comes from. So then it, then it says, Now we know that whatever the law says, it says to those who are under the law. Thousands of years after Adam fell, God gave Moses the Ten Commandments. I am the Lord your God. You shall have no other gods before me. Anything or anyone that you're more obsessed with in your thoughts and your heart affections and your time and your money and what you talk about is another God. And God is very jealous of your affections. So that's the first commandment. I'm the Lord your God. You shall make no graven images. No graven images. You shall not take the name of the Lord your God in vain. I've heard it done at this camp already. If you were in Moses' day, if you blasphemed the name, you were stoned. Honor your father and your mother. Remember the Sabbath day to keep it holy. It says in Timothy that men are lovers of pleasure more than lovers of God. You shall not desire strongly your neighbor's wife or his goods. You shall not commit adultery. And that, Jesus said what? If you just think about it in your heart and desire it, you've already done it before God. You should not lie. You should not steal. So God sends His holy law that's straight from His character. And here's what we are by nature. And so what happens? Well, it's impossible for this nature not to break all these things. But millions, my young people, will be in hell who thought if they kept more of these than they broke, then God's going to let them into heaven. If He does that, He has lowered how holy He is to the person who did the best at it. God cannot lower His standards just because you are not able to keep them. Now, the Bible says in Romans chapter 3 that I'm quoting from, it says, now we know that whatever the law says, it says to those who are under the law, now watch, that every mouth may be stopped and all the world held accountable to God. Therefore, it says no human being will be accepted by God or get into heaven by the works of the law. Well, by trying to keep the law, then what does it do? It says in the Bible that the only thing the law does to sinners like us is show us how bad we are. Rather, through the law, we become conscious of our sin, don't we? I'm going to try so hard to keep the law and be good. 
oh my word, I broke that one twice yesterday and that one and that one. And all it does is show you that you're a lawbreaker. And all it does is convince you that you're a sinner. But it can't get you to heaven. It can't make you righteous. And you know what happens? Everybody, well, wait a minute, Michael. What about all the people that don't, have never seen the Ten Commandments or read them or have, ever had them taught to them? The Bible covers that too. It says that for those who don't have the written law, it says that when they break it, the law is written on their hearts. And they know by nature, the Bible says, even if they haven't been seen the written law, they know from their consciences what the law says because it's written on their hearts. So their consciences, if they do something good, it says, nice job. If they do something wrong, they feel guilty about it. So those people who never have had the written law, the Bible says in Romans chapter 2, they will be judged by the law written on their hearts. So you see, beloved, whether it's the written law or the law written on our hearts, every human being will be held guilty and accountable in God's eyes. Now watch, I want to show you the nature of the law. The Bible says that you keep the whole law, but just break it in one point. You're guilty of breaking the whole law. It's as if I walked up to you with a dagger and I stuck it in your shoulder. You wouldn't say, oh, pain shoulder area, that hurts. What would you do? Ah! Is there any part of me that did not react? No, because Michael is not just a shoulder. I'm a human, I'm a person, and the shoulder's part of the whole. And in a sense, that's what it is with God. Well, God, I only committed, uh, I only uh, lied one time against you my whole life. But you see, God's just not one part of being the truth. He's a unity, so when you offend any part of him, you offend all of God. So James said in James 2.10, if you keep the whole law and break it just at one point, you've broken the whole thing. Now I know you're probably watching, when's this over, I'm going to get out of here. I guarantee you when I'm finished, you will love Jesus so much more. But if you don't understand this, you will never understand John 3.16. You, you won't understand it. I want to help you understand John 3.16 so the next time you hear it, Thank you, Jesus. Now watch. It also says about the law that all who try, rely on trying to keep the law to get God to accept them, watch, they're under a curse. Why? Because the law says, cursed is everyone who doesn't do all of the time all of the things written in the law. There's a curse on you. Oh, Michael, I only, it was only like twice. Come on. No. Because if God, come on, if God comes down to you for those just those two breaks you did, which of course you didn't, then he's only as holy as you are. And guess what, beloved? If that's the case, he's not God. He cannot lower his standards. So everybody, before the law of God, if they die in their sin, every time, every time they broke the law of God, their entire lives will be brought up on that great day. And everyone will have a crime record before the Lord. And most of the millions and millions of sins of the average person are forgotten by the person. But every single one is recorded in heaven. And if the person dies in their sin, they're all brought up before them. And then their sentence about how much they suffer in hell because of all the offenses against the holy loving God, then that determines the degree of punishment they have for all of eternity. Hell is one big place, but there are different degrees of punishment the Bible teaches based on how much people sinned, the degree, what kind of sins they did, how much light they had about the truth that they rejected. All of those things determine where, or so to speak, how much, what kind of torment they will have. Wow. I'm trying to get you, beloved. Believe it or not, when we're over with this, you're going to love Him more. You're going to appreciate Him more. you got to know what He saved you from before you appreciate that He saved you. Amen? I'm trying to get you there. Watch. So it says, no human being is going to be accepted by God into his family and made right with God by the keeping of the law. Rather, through the law we become conscious of sin. Now watch, here's what else the law does. It, it shows us how bad we are. It curses us if we don't keep it perfectly our entire lives. It, it, it condemns us for breaking all of it, even if we only broke one. Now watch, here's another thing that it says the law does. Romans 4.15. The law brings wrath. Can you imagine if our God did not get angry? He's not God. You don't hear much people talking about the wrath of God. But you know what I have found? I'm going to let you in on a little secret. One of the greatest things in my life as a preacher and as a Christian, as a, one who studies God's Word and theology, 
that has produced so much love in my heart and desire to serve God, and it's not as hard as it used to be, is studying about His wrath. The Bible teaches that there are two kinds of wrath with God. There's a present wrath of God that's happening right now. Really? Romans chapter 1, verse 18. It says that the wrath of God is being revealed, right now, present tense, from heaven against all of the unrighteousness and the ungodliness of men. Really? Who hold down the truth by their unrighteousness. Romans 1.18. Why? Because that which can be known about God is plain to them. Because God has made it plain to them by what He's created, but men didn't want it. And you know how God expresses His wrath? In one way, and it's the most scary, it's the, it's the most scary to me, is that God doesn't send the fires of, of, of uh, sulfur and brimstone like He did in Sodom and Gomorrah. You know Sodom and Gomorrah are real places. Sometimes I'm afraid in the back of our minds, that's a little Bible story, it's a little allegory. It's not an allegory. Most biblical scholars believe the remains of Sodom and Gomorrah that were destroyed by the Lord are at the southernmost end of the Dead Sea in the Holy Land, most of it underwater now. They were there, and they're not anymore. Why? God is holy. Right now, this, is, this could be a sermon in itself, and I love to meditate on it because it sobers me. This is, you're not going to believe me when I tell you this, but if the Scripture is true, it must be true. Where we are standing or sitting right now, right here, at one time, was under about five miles of water. Where you are right now, if you looked up, you are two times deeper at the bottom of the sea than the Titanic is. Huh? It says in Genesis chapter 7 that when the Lord said the flood upon the earth, it says that it went above all the high mountains all over the earth. And then it says that it went 20 cubits higher than the highest mountains. What's the highest mountain in the world? Mount Everest, which is about 29,000 something feet, about five miles. So it was about 20... Um, I did even on a calculator last week trying to, I think it was 22 feet higher than Mount Everest. That's how deep the water was. Can you think about it, beloved? The Titanic's two and a half miles down. We're twice as deep here if we were living during the flood. Where we are right now was underwater that deep. Why? God is holy. God is holy. Now get this. There were no children and there were no teenagers on the ark. Let it sink in. You haven't even begun to know God yet, young people. If you don't fear Him. What I beg God does this week is that you fear Him. Well, Michael, I don't know. No. A lot of people don't even like to talk about it. or, or You'd be amazed the preachers that stay away from the things of the fear of God and they change the subject or talk about all the... Ma but you know what? The fear of God is the most precious thing you can have. It's an awesome thing. Well, Michael, how do I know when I have the fear of God or the fear of the devil? Here's how. It's very simple. When you're feeling the fear of God all over you, guess what? You want God. I want more of Him. I'm afraid, Father, I need you. And you're starving for Him because you're so afraid of Him. When it's the devil's fear of God, you, you hide and run from God. And you know, terrify of Him. But there's a fear of God that's pure and clean. And the Bible says you haven't even begun to know God until you fear Him. And when you have that awesome fear of God that comes over you, it's like you can't get enough of Him. You're scared to death of Him, but you want more of Him. That's the fear of God. And if you don't have it, young people, you don't know Him yet. It's the beginning of wisdom. The Bible says the fear of the Lord. You're just starting to know Him when you fear Him. So that's why the law must be preached. Not be, You can't keep it. I'm not preaching and telling you to try to keep it. I'm trying to tell you that you're already guilty of it, and you need a Savior desperately. Now, watch. It says the law brings wrath. So there's a present wrath. And I, I didn't finish that. Forgive me. So there are people who, who are storing up wrath by their stubborn, unrepentant hearts. And for people who want to engage in all this sexual perversion and, and all these evil sexual sins in Romans chapter 1, it says three times that God gave them over to what they wanted. And they no longer thought it was wrong. So God is expressing His wrath that way. And that's the wrath that scares me because you don't know what's happening if you're guilty of it. That's what terrifies me. 
When God destroyed Sodom and Gomorrah, everybody knew. When God destroyed the earth with a flood, everybody knew. But see, these people, when God gives them over to what they want, that are, it is so unnatural and it's vile and it's sexual perversion and idolatry and wickedness, God lets them go. And that's how one way He expresses His wrath and His anger against sin. That's the night I'm afraid of the most. That's why when I meet kids or adults who are terrified that they sin too much for God, I know you have it. You know what the best sign is? Because you're worried about it. It's when people don't worry about it that I get scared. You see. But the other wrath, young people, there's another wrath of God. And you know, let me tell you this. Everything about God is worthy of worship and adorable. I, I adore God because He has wrath. It's a beautiful thing. Why? Because now I'm on the other side of it. Because of Jesus. But there's a wrath to come. John the Baptist, was when he was on the earth, earth remember the Pharisees who came to be baptized? Who warned you to flee from the wrath to come? Remember? Then it says that when Jesus returns, it says he's going to come in the, in the glory of his Father. It says he's going to come in blazing fire with his holy angels to mete out or give out retribu retribution. That's punishment on those who do not know God and who do not obey the gospel. Jesus is coming back with wrath and flaming fire. But you see, because we belong to Him, thank you, Jesus, come quickly. You see, the context of that verse in Thessalonians is because non-Christians have been persecuting Jesus' people. And Paul's trying to tell them it's okay. When He comes back, He's going to deal with them who are troubling you. He's coming back in blazing fire and His holy angels to deal out punishment on those who don't know God and don't obey the gospel. So there's a future wrath that is coming. It says, in Malachi chapter 4, verse 1, it says, that day is coming, and it will burn like a furnace, and all evildoers will be chaff. And chaff, and all good chaff is good for is burned up. So that's what the law of God brings, young people. It brings wrath. And all of you and I are guilty before the law of God. Now, The good news is yet to come. So when you stand before God, the Bible likens human goodness to this kind of robe. Man at his best, when he stands before God, if it's symbolized by a robe, looks something like this, filthy rags. At his best, the most pure, good, noble human being compared to God's holiness looks like this. That's how holy he is. Wow. So then it says, okay, so now you're saying nobody's going to be accepted by God and made his child and go to heaven with him by uh, observing the law. Rather, through the law we become conscious of sin. Now watch. Where's, where's the good news? Now watch. But now... Oh, wait a minute, I've got to do this first. Forgive me. You see... The law brings wrath. And so many times in the scripture, the wrath of God is revealed by fire. That's another sermon in itself that I did years ago. But you see what that says? Our God is a consuming fire. So you see, this is all all human beings deserve because we're all under the curse of the law. We've all violated it. And remember, if you only broke it once, which no one has, no one has You've broken it all. And the only thing all humans deserve is the wrath of God. And the reason that hell is forever is because God is so holy and sin is so evil that it can never be paid for by sinful men. That's why hell doesn't go just for 10,000 years or 1 billion years. That it's forever and ever and ever. You see that, young people? How holy God is? That if man has to pay for his own sin, the penalty... It must be eternal punishment because they've sinned against an eternally, infinitely holy and eternal God. And he can never pay or pay that God back for how he offended him. Now, we're getting to the good news. Verse 21 in Romans chapter 3 is one of the most beautiful in all the Bible. The man who influenced me the most in the Lord, he said, when I was taking Romans in Bible school many years ago, 
He said, this is the most powerful verse in the Bible. He said, that's what the law does to us. But he says, but now, that was then, but now a righteousness from God has been made known. In other words, we just showed you, didn't we, what our righteousness deserves? Our best righteousness is, a, is cursed. It brings the wrath of God and eternal punishment. But watch now. But now a righteousness from God has been made known. Apart from law. The law is way over here because the righteousness that God demands of you to be able to live with Him forever, it has nothing to do with the law. But now a righteousness apart from law has been made known. Here it is. This is what I call the salvation chest or the grace chest. Alright? And that symbolizes all the golden salvation that God has provided. And in this golden chest, it says life on the top, symbolizing eternal life. And in this golden chest, it's full of light. It has all of the things symbolized by what Jesus did for us. His blood, his A-plus report card, ours was an F-minus that we deserve by trying to keep the law. Our adoption papers, I mean all the things that symbolize salvation is in this chest. And guess where it came from? Romans 3.21 says, But now a righteousness from God has been made known apart from law on the other side of the room. Now the law and the prophets talk about this, but they can never produce it. Alright? A righteousness which comes through faith in Jesus Christ to all who believe. Alright? It says there is no difference between Jews or non-Jews and those are the only two kind of people on the earth in God's eyes as far as um, physically, Jews or non-Jews. But now he says that all have sinned, both Jews and non-Jews, and uh, all have sinned and come short of God's glory. His holy, His holy, perfect standards of the law. All have sinned and come short of the glory of God. Now watch. But they're justified. What does that mean, Michael? When you're justified before God, it means when you stand before the Lord, He will not say, condemned, guilty, eternal punishment forever. When you're justified before God, it means He accepts you as righteous. He says, righteous! How does He do that? Watch. All of sin and fall short of the glory of God, but are justified freely by His grace as a gift. Oh, so Michael, I mean, he's just going to give... I mean, a lot of people teach this. Oh, so he's going to let everybody get saved in the end. Nobody's going to hell. That's called universalism. It's not biblical. No, it says that He saves freely as a gift by His grace. Watch now. Through the redemption that comes through Christ Jesus. Remember that in your memory verse today? What's redemption? It's something all of you need. What do you mean? All of you, whether you think it or feel it or believe it or know it, this is what sin has done to us. Before you're a Christian, the Bible says that you need to be redeemed. Redeemed from what? You're under the curse of the law. You're under the bondage of the law. You're a prisoner of Satan and a child of his. Sin has you bound. Do you get that impression from your friends who don't know the Lord when you're hanging out with them that they realize this is happening? You know why? I wish I had it. I couldn't find it. I don't have it with me. But there's blinders because one of the most dangerous things about sin is it blinds people who are trapped in it. That's why... Your friends who don't know the Lord, in the eyes of God, they have a ball and chain around their neck. They're prisoners, and they don't even know it, and they don't even care. Just like you didn't until God came after you. So it says that the only way we get saved is through the redemption that's in Christ Jesus. What does that mean, Michael, redemption? Because this is what we're like by nature. Remember the jar? We need to be redeemed. You know what redeemed means? It means the freeing of a prisoner by the payment of a ransom. Well, what do I got to give? Do I try to go to church more? Don't waste your time. I've got a lot of money. i got a, a safety deposit box. Go. P Peter said that you're not redeemed by perishable things like silver and gold. You could have more gold than Solomon and the Queen of Sheba together. And he had like 666 talents of it. It was like four and a half tons. or It was ridiculous. That could not redeem you from the curse of sin and the penalty of sin. Peter says there's only one thing that can. 
It's not silver and it's not gold. Does he believe it or not, though? They seem to last forever. They're going to perish too. The fires that are coming, Second Peter, are going to be so hot to purify the earth, they're going to melt the elements. That includes silver and gold. He said they were redeemed with the precious blood of Christ. So, if you are not in Jesus and he's not in you tonight, beloved, this is what you look like to God in the invisible realm. You're still a prisoner of sin. You're a prisoner of the law. You belong to Satan and you don't even know it. And he has you blinded like 2 Corinthians 4, 4 says and you don't even care. But watch. You can become God's child as a gift by His grace through the redemption that comes through Christ Jesus. Now here's the main point of the whole sermon. Remember? God the Father presented Him as a propitiation. Most of your Bibles say... God presented him as a sacrifice of atonement. Alright? What is that? A propitiation, young people, is the offering of a sacrifice to take away wrath. So, anyone who's not in Jesus Christ still has the wrath of God hanging over their heads. Well, Michael, I thought John 3.16, For God so loved the world... Yes. That He gave His only begotten Son. Yes. But, the Bible says, He who believes in the Son has life. He who does not believe in the Son does not have life. But He's condemned already, and the wrath of God abides on Him. Present tense. So all of your friends who are not Christians and in Christ, though God provided His Son out of love for the world, the wrath of God is still on those who are not in Christ. Now watch. Remember, the law brings wrath. So here's what the offering of Jesus is. This is what propitiation is. The offering of a sacrifice to turn away wrath. Now what says that God, in 325, God presented him as a sacrifice of atonement or as a propitiation. How? Through what? Through his blood. Well, why, why blood? A lot of religions don't like the blood of the Christianity. Got to have the blood. Why? Because it says in the Bible that the life of a person is in their blood. So, Jesus had to shed his blood and pour out his life so that the penalty of sin, which is death, would be paid. Because remember, the wages of sin is death. If God doesn't see death, it's not paid for. Well, let me die for my own sin. Because you're a sinner, you would be doing that for all of eternity and never pay. That's how holy God is, as I said earlier. So what? God sent Jesus Christ out of His love for the world, all right, as a propitiation. God set Him forth. Now, for all of those who put their trust in Him, the wrath of God was put on Him for six hours of indescribable agony. See, we only ever hear people talk about the crown of thorns and the nails. and That was horrible enough. Don't, don't get me wrong. I'm a baby when I get stuck with a pin. But you know, we, my young, young people, there was so much going, more going on because of the sins of all of God's people for all time were put on Jesus Christ before He went to the cross. And with our sin on Him and the sins of all Christians of all time, they were on Him. Now remember, what God did to the world... Remember what God did to the world? By one bite of one piece of fruit, by one man, the whole world was plunged into darkness and sin and death and bondage. If that, if that was the punishment for one bite, what was going on on the cross with the millions of people who are Christians but from the time of Adam to the last soul who becomes a Christian? The average person, millions of sins in their lifetime? Amen? All of those sins at the cross were put on Jesus Christ. I, I can't even, I don't even know what to say and I'm afraid to ask my theological brothers. Guys, what exactly, what was God the Father doing to him for those six hours with those trillions of sins on him? The more you think about that, the more you start to not question hell anymore. Wow. Hell's not hot enough and it's not long enough for those who reject this. That's what a propitiation is, young people. If the fire doesn't go to Him, it must come to you and me. 
He did in six hours what sinners will pay all of eternity to try to pay and won't be able to. Now, we're almost done. You've been very patient, but this is so important. Then it says, why did... It? And I'm going to ask the question. He presented him as a propitiation through faith in his blood. One who turned aside the wrath of God by the offering of a sacrifice, his life. Now it says that God did this to demonstrate his justice. Why? Why did God need to show everybody how righteous he was? Here's why. Here's what it says. Because in God's forbearance, he left the sins that were committed beforehand unpunished. All the sins from the fall of Adam all the way up the thousands of years to the cross of Christ, it says that God finally had to do this to show all of creation I'm holy. I hate sin. Because it says in His long suffering and His patient endurance, He left all those sins by all those people unpunished. So once and for all, God shows all of creation, both men and devils and angels, I'm going to demonstrate how righteous I am. Because people start accusing God of everything, don't they? Ah, he's lax. He doesn't care. Let's keep doing this, man. God doesn't do anything. No, no. God showed for all time how much he hates sin. Even when it was put on the pristine innocence of the altogether lovely one, his son. Still, God couldn't let Jesus off the hook when he was carrying our sin. That's how much God hates sin. And Jesus endured the punishment. So God did this to show, I let those go all those years, but I'm going to show you how much I hate sin. All right? And then it says, last thing, it says that God did this to show His justice so that now He can forgive sinners and people can't say of Him, you're forgiving Tommy? That scum? I know what he did. You're letting him go and making him your son and calling him a Christian? That's scum! You're lax. You don't care. You don't... No, 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 no. All of Tommy's sins were, because of his faith in Jesus, were put on him. I punished Tommy's sins there. I'm just. I didn't excuse Tommy's sins. I didn't overlook them. I didn't let them slip by. I judged them because I'm just. And now, because Tommy's sins have been paid for, I can say, Tommy, you're justified. You're accepted. You're forgiven. You're acquitted. Now God can be the one who forgives sin because He punished it somewhere. The Bible says, without the shedding of blood, there's no forgiveness or remission of sin. Wow. That's why propitiation now to me is such a beautiful word. Because I, I see every day what a scum I am. And I get depressed often. My wife will say, Michael, look at me and smile. But I'm too focused on my own sin. And that's not good. I'm getting slowly but surely, getting over it. But this is what sets me free and changes me. There's a way, oh, thank you, Lord. Jesus is my propitiation. All that anger that I deserve from you, Father, He already took. Michael, how do I get this for me so that I don't get the torch forever and ever? I'm not a card-playing man. Here's how you get it. It says that he offered him as a propitiation, amen, through faith in his blood, in his sacrifice. When you have a good hand in cards, you know, you'll only put as much money on the table, unless you're bluffing, right? As powerful as your hand is, right? If you have a real bad hand, you guys, I don't know, maybe you play cards, I just don't, but I know a little bit. If you're sitting at a card table, let's say playing poker, you're only going to put as much money and chips on the table as you think you have a good enough hand to beat your opponent. Amen? Watch. Faith in Him to have this happen for you is that I'm putting all my chips for eternal life on Him. Michael, you're going to bet all your chips on Him? All my chips. I'm so sure of the hand I've got. All my life and the eternal destiny, the destiny of my soul, to avoid the lake of fire that burns with sulfur and brimstone, I'm betting it all on him. 
Not me. I'm going to trust in Muhammad, and I'm going to trust in uh, eating black strap molasses tea and uh, you know quoting mantra for three years. I wouldn't put a lot of chips on that, because you're going to face the wrath of God and the holiness of God with black strap molasses tea, or a prophet who died, or any other religion. See, he's worthy to be trusted, young people, and give your life to because of what he's done. All my chips. Here comes Girton. Why should we let you in? Not that God would talk to me that way. But uh, all, I, I put all my trust in another person. What do you have to say for yourself? Nothing. I am the worst there ever was. I have no hope to even think that I could be accepted by you or come into this lovely place because of anything I did or tried not to do. I'm putting all my chips on another person and his righteousness. And you know what God the Father does? Come on in. I've been waiting for you. My roommate, my roommate at Bible school said this years ago, I'll never forget it. If when you get up to heaven and you're standing at the gate, so to speak, if you say anything else but Jesus, you won't get in. Never forgotten that. That was 30 years ago. If you say anything else but Jesus, you won't get in. Two things keep people out of heaven. Their sin and their own righteousness. Remember, it has to be absolutely perfect if you're going to try to get God to accept you with yours. Okay? Here's one benefit of this. And I'm going to take the time, because it'll only take a few minutes. I'm going to do it because, hey. What's a benefit of, of understanding this stuff that I would guess many of your parents have never heard? I mean, I myself, I'm just getting it because I'm feeding myself because I'm desperate to know this stuff. Because I want to change and I want to love God more. This is what causes me to love God more. Now watch. Michael, if I really meditate and embrace this and understand it and study it and really take it in and just really get this truth, what's, gonna, what's it going to do for me? Well, it just saved you from the wrath of God for all of eternity. And the Father has made you His child through Jesus Christ. He's taken the ball and chain off your neck that you didn't even know was there. All of your sins for your entire life as a Christian have been laid on Him and punished. Now watch what else it will do. How many have seen Pinocchio? Remember what Pinocchio was doing in the pool hall when he was playing, with, playing pool with, with Lampwick? What was he doing? What did, he have in, what did he have? Yep. Pinocchio is a children's movie. That's been my favorite for many years. But remember his friend Lampy, Lampwick, who was very arrogant and cocky? You take orders from a beetle! Remember Jiminy Cricket came on top of the pool table and he was very upset because Pinocchio was smoking and drinking and playing pool and hanging out in this terrible place called Pleasure Island? Remember? And so Lampwick, his friend, started mocking Jiminy Cricket. He said, you take orders from a beetle? You know, right and wrong. And his friend Lampwick was mocking the things of righteousness and good and the difference between good and evil. And Lampwick's drinking this brew and he's smoking a cigar, remember? And he's playing pool, not knowing that the evil coachman who lured them into Pleasure Island and these de demonic looking creatures, do you remember that scene? As the boys are all into Pleasure Island and all the pleasures of the world, all of a sudden, hey, blokes, you get those doors shut and get those cages. So why the boys are all involved in all the pleasures of the of Pleasure Island, just like the, the things of the world you face every day, little did they know that the doors were being shut. Remember? They were being locked in. They took the bait of Pleasure Island, and they were living for sin and self and pleasure. Come on in, smoke your brains out. Then the rough house, the roughest, toughest joint. Every kind of sin pleasure that little boys liked. And so they're involved in it, but they didn't know that while they were enjoying all these evil pleasures of the world, Pleasure Island, they were being trapped and locked in, and they were being turned into what? Into donkeys. What do you think I look like, a jackass? Remember he turned around? And what did Pinocchio go? You sure do! Ha! And remember what Lampwick said? And no, the Lampwick said, did that come out of me? And what did Pinocchio go? And then what happened? Huh? Remember, he, remember the tail came out first when he was bending over to shoot? Like that? And then what happened next? Remember the ears popped up? And then what did Lampwick do? Huh? 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 I've been double-crossed! I've been double-crossed! 
and all of that arrogance and digging and cool and cocky and ridiculing all the things that right and wrong, mocking Pinocchio and Jiminy Cricket, all of a sudden that all changed. And you know, and Pinocchio, when he saw Lampwick being turned into a jackass and a fool, remember, Ma! who did he start calling, calling for? Mommy! Remember his hands turned into hooves? And he, ah, and he bent over, his clothes ripped off. Remember, he kicked the mirror, and a chair went flying over Pinocchio's head. But when Pinocchio started seeing that happen to his friend, who was so cool, and mocked the things of righteousness, what did Pinocchio do? Who remembers? He realized, oh my word, this stuff's drugged. This is what's happening to Lampwick. And it's such a powerful scene in this children's movie from 1941. Pinocchio slides the thing that was drugging them away, and he flips his cigar out. That's what I'm hoping for you kids this week. That you get so filled with the scriptures and the knowledge of God and the fear of the Lord that when you go back, and I know you're surrounded by friends, you know, but if they're taking you down and you're not taking them to Jesus, they're not your friends, they're your enemies. Does Jesus love He sure does love them. But you know what? If they're, t if they're pulling you down, He doesn't want you with them. He wants you to be like Pinocchio in a sense, seeing that they're mocking the things of God, they're not interested in God. You keep praying for them, try to reach them if you can, but you'll find one of two things will happen. You'll influence them for the kingdom, or they'll take you down. So you know what you do? You push the mug away. You flick the cigar. Okay, I see what the pleasures of the world are doing to the, my, fr my friends, and I pray that the stuff that you've learned here, and not just here, of course, but the whole, the whole week, when you go home, you push the mug away and flick the cigar. Wait a minute. I see what's happening. I see it. You'll never see it unless you stay immersed in the Word of God and in His presence. Let's pray.